two speakers. The first speaker will be Hope Bryan, who is a member of the SWP in Birmingham, and the second will be Laura Badasco, an LGBT member in Glasgow, and we're starting off with Hope, so I'll hand over to Hope. Yeah, thanks, Shona, and thanks, everybody, for uh, coming today uh, to this day school. I just want to start, really, by talking about how important, I think, it is to have the day school today. Because as we've seen over the last few years, there's been an increasing wave of hostility towards LGBT plus people. If you look over in Italy, the newly elected uh, fascist prime minister, Giorgio Maloney, said yes to the national family, no to the LGBT lobby, yes to sexual identity, no to agenda ideology. And another fascist over in Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, said we insist marriage in Hungary is between a man and a woman. A father is a man and a mother is a woman. Then they should leave our children alone. Fascists have zeroed in on the idea that in talking about LGBT plus issues is dangerous for children. That is because they are hyper-focused on restricting any form of relationship that is outside the confines of the nuclear family, meaning they want to push all the reforms that LGBT plus people have won over the last few years right back. But these tropes about the LGBT lobby trying to brainwash kids isn't just confined to fascists in Europe, but in the belly of the beast, the USA, we've seen the same kind of moral panic whipped up in the name of culture wars. Ron DeSantis, the current governor of Florida, but is tipped to throw his hat in the ring for the Republican Party presidential primary, passed the Don't, gay, uh, Don't Say Gay Bill into law. This law would make it impossible for teachers to have discussions in the classrooms around sexuality and gender identity, akin to the Section 8, 20, uh, 28 law introduced by Margaret Thatcher over here. And there has been a similar wave of anti-LGBT plus laws across America. For example, in Tennessee, there have been protests outside the Vanderbilt Hospital, spearheaded by right-wing Daily, uh, Daily Wire's Matt Walsh, over gender-affirming care for kids. And recently, Tennessee has passed an anti-drag bill banning adult cabaret performances in public spaces. And we can see these threads continue here in the UK as well. We've seen, uh, we've seen protests against Drag Queen Story Hour, which have links to fascists and the far right, along with protests outside of hotels uh, holding asylum seekers. They suggest that they are protecting women and children from leftists who want to indoctrinate and harm children. But it seems to me that if they were really interested about uh, protecting children, they'd be protesting outside of Buckingham Palace and places like that, not outside uh, drag queen story hours. Yet these, yet these far right protests don't exist in a vacuum. They are buoyed up by the narrative pushed by the Tories. Prior to Rishi Sunak being PM, both him and the celebrated former Prime Minister Liz Trust was asked during the Talk TV leadership debate whether a trans woman is a woman, and both said no. And more recently, the Tories made moves to block the reform in Scotland that would make it easier for people to be legally recognised by, uh, by, by the gender they identify. With. It seems like the situation is pretty bleak all around the world, and it is for many LGBT people, as these, this rhetoric has real life consequences. But I think it's important that we look at the roots of where this oppression comes from in order to understand it, and more importantly, so we can fight it and win true liberation. This is especially important when most common narratives cite the natural biology for the existence of LGBT plus oppression or the fault of religion. But I, what I want to argue here is that it was the emergence of class society and then capitalism which cemented the oppression we see today. This understanding demonstrates that all forms of oppression, including LGBT plus oppression, have not always existed. There is nothing innate about it. Therefore, we can fight for a world where it doesn't exist. But in order to do that, we have to tear down the system, the class system that created it, and that means tearing down capitalism itself. It's Frederick Engels who details in the origin of the family private property in the state, how early hunter-gatherer societies, which make up the vast amount of human history, developed into class society, and how the idea of the nuclear family developed with it. Firstly, it's important to point out that Engels refers to hunter-gatherer societies as primitive communism 
meaning that although there was a division of labor between uh, women and men, with women mainly doing the gathering and men doing the hunting, both of these tasks had equal standing in society. Neither group had domination over the other, which means they lived in relative uh, uh, equality. And in these societies, there were few controls on sexual relations between group members apart from incest. There were fluid forms of marriage, sexuality, and gender. Sexual relations between those of the same sex were very common, especially because the group could only afford to have as many children as the tribe could carry when moving around from place to place. And the, in these early societies, the idea of someone conscribing to a different gender was commonplace. If agreed by the tribe elders, they could be initiated into another gender role and become, for all social and economic purposes, a different gender. But human beings are unique amongst the animal world, as they are both able to interact with their environment, but also change the world around them, and through that process, change themselves. We find new ways of producing the necessities of life to ease the material conditions conditions uh, of the world and these new ways of producing create new relations between each member of the group. It is through this process that human beings developed from primitive communism, which as I said dominated most of human history, into a class society. Over time communities began to uh, develop things like the plough that allowed them to settle and farm the land rather than moving around, living hand to mouth. It was this development of agriculture which allowed them to produce more than was immediately needed by the group, but conditions were still precarious during these periods, meaning they were as susceptible as ever to severe weather conditions like droughts and storms. And realising this, there was a necessity for some people within that group to be freed from work in the fields and the manual labour to ensure that the surplus was put aside for the future in case of the occurrence of a severe weather event. It is this process that the family and the state were created. Once a surplus had been achieved, an interest began to rise, which was to pass this wealth down to biological heirs, meaning that men had to know for certain who their children were, meaning monogamy, at least by women, began to be enforced. And over time, as the bounds of the family got stricter and stricter, we start to see the restriction of same-sex relationships and, uh, and identifying as different genders. The path that leads to LGBT plus suppression that we see today takes quite a complicated route. For example, in early ancient Greece and Rome, there was quite clear evidence that suggests that sex between men and boys were openly embraced, considered quite compatible with things like marriage and children, and in many instances, openly celebrated. However, there were contradictions with this view of sexuality. It was not all completely free and accepted. Whilst the sexual behaviours of older men were celebrated, the younger boys were looked down upon. Possibly this is due to the role in which these younger boys played in their sexual relationship. Their willingness to be in submission to older men was considered dishonourable for a future citizen of Rome or Greece. This is due to the uh, submissive role being seen as more feminine, and in this society, women were completely segregated from public life, and their only roles were to look after the household and have children, and so it was not suitable for these young men to be seen as, uh, as feminine. But from about the 8th century to the 12th century in Western Europe, there was no particular hostility to same-sex relations. It wasn't until the economic crises and plagues of the 14th century when sexual uh, restrictions on sexuality really began. However, this was not necessarily a direct attack on homosexuals, but was a push to force a procreative sex. This meant restricting the number of se uh, the sexual acts like anal sex, sex with animals, and other forms of sex that would not result in contraception. But these were all punished fairly equally. For example, in Florence in this time period, women and underage boys that submitted to anal sex faced the same punishment to be whipped naked in the streets. But it was only after industrialisation that we see the modern form of homophobia begin to rise. Industrialisation ripped through all of the old social ties and thus we saw a change in sexual behaviours. Whereas before most people lived in the countryside, in their family units, industrialisation forced them into the growing towns and cities. No longer were family households a place of production, so the traditional roles of each family, uh, family was broken. Both men, women and children were forced to go work in the factories.
However, this set the capitalist class into a panic, as they do not need a strong family, as they need a strong family tie to both produce and socialise the next generation of workers. We begin to see many accounts at the time detailing the brutality of industrialisation by showing the horrific conditions of the factories, mines and the slums. But there was an overt focus on sexual behaviours as well. Many factory commis uh, commissioners regularly asked questions regarding the chastity of factory girls they detailed that men would often share close and cramped quarters with other men and the same goes for women and depicted in towns and cities as having a prostitute at every corner. So reformers encouraged the nuclear family, modelled on the ruling class idea of the family and encouraged things like the idea of a family wage which intended to keep women at home and recreate the ideas between the private and public spheres in which men had to bring home the money whilst women traditionally looked after the household. The regulation of this role in the home and the public was accompanied by an increase in the regulation of sexual behaviour and homosexuality for the, uh, the, uh, for the first time, which marked it as specifically deviant. Homosexuality as a term did not arrive until the late 19th century, and although, no, although there were words describing sex between men and women that marked it as sinful, it was not until that period that it was seen as an underlying condition or a type of person. Mary McIntosh, a gay rights activist and soci uh, sociologist, illustrates how this attempt to put people in either camp of homosexual or heterosexual was the purpose to segregate the deviant from others. The creation of a specialised, despised and punished role of homosexual keeps the bulk of society pure, rather the same way as similar treatment of some kinds of criminals help keep the rest of society law-abiding. This strict regulation of sexual behaviour was marked uh, by the trial and subsequent jailing of Oscar Wilde in 1895 for gross indecency by laws that remain till the 1960s. So as I've outlined, the acceptance of homosexuality and trans people have been radically different throughout the different periods of history and often reflects the social, political and economic conditions at the time, but fundamentally it's the creation of class society in which antagonisms begin to grow. Capitalism then cements these antagonisms because it needs to socialise and reproduce the next generation of workers. This is why politicians are hyper-focused on things like the family. But LGBT plus oppression is used for something more under capitalism. I talked at the beginning about the current climate we find ourselves in with the growing attacks on LGBT people, which Laura, I think, will go into more. But I think it's important that we understand that the right whips up homophobia and transphobia in order to divide the working class. And the same goes for racism and sexism, because it weakens our strength as a class when we're divided. That's why we cannot get rid of homophobia, transphobia, under capitalism, or any form of class society, for that matter. And why we have to look to a radically different kind of world in order to fight this oppression. We have to look towards revolution, because through struggle, we are able to throw off these ideas and replace them with ideas of collectivity and solidarity and a society in which everyone is viewed equal. And I'll finish there and hand over to Laura. I'm sorry for not being able to be there in person, but I can't say I'm too sorry because the reason I can't be there is because there are very strikes and we're really happy to see workers on strike. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. I wanted to start by saying that, as Hope has clearly outlined, there is obviously a clear reason why capitalism needs LGBT oppression to exist. And, you know, as she has said, this is dependent on the creation of a family unit that essentially upholds and perpetuates is this exploitive nature of capitalism by giving a new generation of workers to exploit. However, and as you know, I've enjoyed her introduction as much I'm sure everyone has done, uh, I can probably tell you have a question really that comes from that introduction. So Hope has basically outlined the creation of the family unit and you know, she's referenced the time period in which the family unit was very heavily enforced but the question here that I feel like people in the audience might have is um, why are we talking about the creation of the family in the industrial revolution and why are we talking about events a hundred years ago to explain LGBT oppression um, is this too relevant today and can we talk about LGBT oppression today uh, as explained by this concept of the family so I, I wanted to start by saying that this is understandable because if you look at that you have this question if you look at the context in which we are living uh, it understandably raises questions. After all, you know, the family unit has changed considerably uh, since the events that Hope has described 
well, first of all, you know, women have entered the workplace, and it's quite uncommon that families are able to just subsist anymore if only one parent works. Um, and arguably, only the ruling class now is able to maintain this sort of lifestyle. Um, secondly, which I think is relevant here, is the idea that the state and society have started to recognize different families, families of one parent, families um, that is not essentially the rigid framework of the family that Pope has described. And even, you know, families with two parents of uh, the same gender, so essentially here you might be thinking the family unit has morphed around LGBT people to sort of slowly start recognizing them. And although, you know, it's important to recognize that this is still limited in many countries, uh, many other countries also recognize the right of LGBT families to exist, to have their partnership legally recognized, and the right for those families to either adopt or conceive their children. So the question here is, surely if families can now be comprised of two people of the same gender, there's no point using the logic of the family unit to explain LGBT oppression, right? So I can already tell you that this is not what I'll be arguing here today, but my task here is to try and answer the question of whether this analysis of LGBT oppression using the idea of the family unit is still relevant today. And my second task here essentially will be to explain why to get rid of LGBT oppression. We not only need to just broaden the idea of the family as we have done in the past to include it. LGBT people, but to entirely get rid of a system that needs the family unit to survive, which is capitalism, as Hope has outlined. So for to answer this question, I'd like to start by unraveling some of the things that I've mentioned here that must, might be, you know, making you a bit skeptical. Um, so I want to look at the context in which we are currently seeing, once again, how LGBT people are under attack. And there are two ways in which I want to show why the idea of the family unit still persists today. The first one of them is just, you know, look around. Reforms can be rolled back at any time, just look at Italy. Um, and I want to argue that they will do that by using this same rhetoric of the family unit that Hope has described. Um, the second one of them is that capitalism will, will always rely on divide and rule tactics to preserve its dominance over society, and that LGBT liberation is essentially a threat to this strategy, and therefore it has to be used, uh, homophobia and transphobia have to be used at return to both divide the working class, but also pose LGBT rights that could be harmful to ruling class ideas. So let's start with the first one, uh, the idea that the family unit has changed today. I think it's important to note that, you know, even for the ruling class, the idea of the family of what man and woman uh, should be like according to the, to, has changed according to the material conditions of the time period. So for example, you know, we have the expectations about the homemaker and the housewife in the 50s versus the obsession with the career woman in the 80s and 90s. But what I want to argue here is that the ruling class needs homophobia and its transphobia. They need gender roles and they need the family unit because this is uh, twisted into something that shapes the needs of a society that essentially privileges one class above the other. And um, here I hope to address the question of what really happens when the family unit starts to include LGBT people and the ruling class seems to sort of tolerate us to the point of even, uh, God forbid, letting us get married or adopt or have children. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we are all only tolerated and useful just as long as they can exploit us or we can make the money. You can see that very clearly with sort of the portrayal of LGBT people that the ruling classes have decided to somewhat support and get behind. In most cases, you know, this will be a picture of an LGBT couple that they consider mirror straight relationship dynamics, which often boils down to the question of, you know, who's the man in the relationship and things like that. Even in a in an LGBT couple that looks nothing like the alleged, alleged nuclear family, we're still expected to conform to these expectations if we want to be accepted. And, you know, of course, this includes not only relationships between people of opposite genders, but also so it extends to bisexual men and women who are expected to still conform to the traditional family unit, uh, despite being part of the LGBT community as well. Um, so the question here is, what happens when their profits are at risk, when the ruling classes start seeing their control in society sleep and they can't perpetuate these ideas anymore? What, uh, LGBT people go from being tolerated to being shunned really, really quickly. And you can just take a look around to realize that this is the case. For example, we can see the Tories trying to whip up a moral panic over trans and non-binary people as a way of trying to preserve their control and keep attention away from their failings. They're not talking about the uh, inspiring wave of strikes that is sweeping the country. They're talking about bathrooms and they're talking about the GIA reform as a way to try and divert attention from that. Um, another grim example is, of course, the stripping away of LGBT rights that we're seeing today and in general, you know, bodily autonomy in times of capitalist crisis uh, such as now, like 
looking at America and our hungry, as Hope has described. Um, but another example, really, is the way that this rhetoric will be used to attack LGBT people and justify the stripping away of the rights. For example, as Hope has described, we have seen Meloni, who's the fascist prime minister of Italy, talk about safeguarding family family values by banning LGBT people from registering their children as theirs. Um, so essentially, from Italy to Hungary, as Hope has described, we have seen this rhetoric used by the ruling class to cement the rule and to try and divide the working class. Um, another example uh, that is present here in Britain today is the presence of far-right group turning in UK in events such as Drag Queen Story Hour, which they are trying to uh, protest. But luckily, you know, they have been opposed by local anti-fascists despite them facing police brutality. But nevertheless, the rhetoric of this, this uh, far-right people would use to justify attacking events like this is that they pose a threat to children and the traditional family and, you know, the ideas associated with traditional gender roles. So their justification for doing so is cover all over and protect the children or, you know, the false concern that over the safeguarding of this imaginary children who might be at risk of a drag queen reading them a story. Um, so the question here is, okay, we understand that the ideology of the family you know, is useful for capitalism in the way that this perpetuates the next generation of labor. But is there anything else that the ruling classes are taking from the oppression of LGBT people that could also justify them perpetuating homophobia and transphobia? We have explained how the idea of the family unit is essential to them and how they will use this rhetoric to try and perpetuate themselves. But what else are they getting from this situation in which LGBT people are oppressed? So that brings me on to the second point which I wanted to make, which is the ideas of the Biden rule. And this is a very essential principle that the ruling class has been used since forever to try and perpetuate themselves. And that is just the idea of dividing the working class into these artificial lines that can then be used to foster inequality and prevent them organizing and mobilizing massively. So essentially, we're working under the logic of capitalism here, which is that if um, LGBT people are being oppressed and the working class see the LGBT working class people as the enemies, there is no chance of them uniting to fight back against the ruling class and to overthrow the system that's created oppression in the first place. Um, I want to argue that this is a very powerful tactic that the ruling class wants to use, and this is paired with timing, really. Um, I want to argue that it is timing and the general crisis of capitalism that sees them trying to use these tactics very often to try and not only um, oppress LGBT people and foster homophobia and transphobia, but to attempt to roll back the gains of the past with whipping up um, moral panic and further restrict control and bodily autonomy. Um, this is, you know, it's no coincidence that we're seeing this happen today in the fact that Italy has been trying to roll back the gains in LGBT rights, that we're seeing the GRA reform made resistance. It's no coincidence to the overall crisis that capitalism is facing. Because I want to argue capitalism itself is a system that continually creates crisis and LGBT liberation as a, as a goal will be stuck in this cycle where any gains that we make through continuous organized effort could just be easily rolled back. Um, so the question here is, we've described what the ruling class will try and do to preserve control with this how we're stuck in this cycle in which um, timing and general crisis can put all of our rights at risk without anything that um, can stop them from doing that. But the question here is, now that we know the sort of the root of this type of um, oppression, what can we do to fight it? And Hope has uh, already outlined some solutions, but I want to walk, um, sort of walk you through the potential alternatives. So the first one of them is let's all you know, gather and decide we're all voting Labour, even though I, it'd be a hard thing to argue in today's um, society. But let's say we try and vote people in that can give us some rights. Would that get us liberation? Well, that, I want to argue here that that is never going to be the case because there is nothing in the, um, in the system that is organized so that we can win and achieve real LGBT liberation. And I think you can just take one look around to realize how this cannot be the case. What happens 
Um, for example, in Spain, when they passed the, the equivalent of the DRA reform, which was incredibly positive for trans and non-binary people in Spain, is that the next cycle of elections, the far right would win, and that reform would go uh, just as quickly. So the question here of electoral politics, even though we welcome reforms and we will fight for them, uh, electoral politics will not get us that sort of liberation for LGBT people. So another alternative that I want to pose with, and this is what I will end on, is that we tackle the root of the problem exactly where it starts. And if they're using the violent rule tactics and they are trying to perpetuate the idea of capitalism by using homophobia, transphobia, and other forms of oppression, is that we organize instead of dividing ourselves and, rule it, and letting them rule and just um, come together as a mass movement that fights for real liberation by getting rid of the system that creates this oppression in the first place. And, you know, this is not some abstract idea. We can just look at how in terms of sort of heightened class struggle, uh, we also see the confidence of the working class rise to demand an end to oppression that was rampant at the time when this happened. For example, we can look at the minor strike to see how uh, both working class people's confidence could rise, but also uh, th this could bring about solidarity with LGBT people. And I want to even go further than that, but to suggest uh, a point in time where we actually saw a glimpse of what actual liberation could look like by tackling the root of the problem. And I want to mention in the sort of few minutes that I have left the example of the Russian Revolution as a way to explain what we mean by this um, real liberation. Sorry, would you please stop? So in uh, I think that was my warning. All right, yeah. all right, let me just finish with this. I'll tell you uh, in this example, in 1917, the Russian Revolution that happened swept away from the, with the old ways. And over 100 years ago now, uh, we saw a society start to emerge that was just totally different than what we um, would have seen at the time, maybe five or six years. Uh, in which the Bolsheviks, who were at the forefront of the revolution, understood that liberation and socialism were intertwined, and we could start to see a society that was getting rid of the family unit entirely altogether. And I'm sure that we sessions, I, I know for a fact that we will talk more about this later on, but I just wanted to give people sort of a taste of what real liberation could look like, and I want to point at the example of how the Russian Revolution both the way uh, the root of capital of oppression by trying to get rid of capitalism and by removing the foundation and for this oppression um, we saw an end to women's oppression um, we start to see an end to women's oppression and LGBT oppression altogether so um, I'll let people get on with the discussion but just to summarize the ruling class will use any tactics of the Biden rule by appealing to the family unit to try and preserve their um, rule in the capitalist system that we see, the way to get rid of the ruling classes and oppression and LGBT phobia in all its forms is to go to the root of the problem and tackle uh, capitalism, which is the system that relies on oppression and that will only allow true liberation to appear if we get rid of the system altogether. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. And go to the next sessions. So let me just start by saying that absolutely, as some of the uh, people were saying, I think people in, in, in room will agree that liberation for one means liberation for all. And we absolutely cannot pick and choose who gets to live a better life, who's going to have better rights under capitalism, because just as long as we live under capitalism, the rights of any minority will be under attack. And it's just a question of time before they come for, for you if they haven't done so already. But it applies also, obviously, to uh, things like climate change and tackling um, the destruction of the planet. Um, so I just really wanted to stress that this is not a game of let's fight for this one particular issue until we win and then we'll get to a different issue and eventually we'll get rid of all types of oppression. It is a question of we can rid of, get rid of all of them at the same time and we absolutely be should be fighting for that um, instead of trying to decide which one should go first. And I just wanted to sort of make this sum up about this, the relevance and the importance of doing that uh, today and in the here and now. I know there's been lots of references to the past and what society might look like uh, when we have a revolution or even after that. But the question here is what can we do in the here and now to fight for LGBT rights to fight against homophobia and transphobia and what have you. And here the key point uh, that I want 
want everyone to take from this session is that we're not fighting one individual fight. We're not necessarily only showing up to protest about LGBT rights, then going home and waiting for the next one. But what we can do um, to bring about LGBT rights is necessarily interlinked with being able to participate in class struggle to try and increase the class struggle that we're seeing today. And a great example of that is the, the strikes that we're seeing at the moment. It is impossible to conceive liberation for LGBT people without that be, being part of the um, emancipation and the liberation of the entire working class at the same time. Um, so it is key that we understand that to fight for LGBT oppression, we need to, to fight against LGBT oppression, good God. Uh, we need to uh, understand that uh, these ideas need to be interlinked with ideas that class struggle um, is important and is what's going to hand us the key to liberation. And I just wanted to end before I hand it over to Hope on on the idea that if we want to fight for LGBT rights, we want to fight for the end of any kind of oppression, we need to start supporting the strikes right now. We need to start um, going down to the picket lines and discussing things with people that we meet on the picket lines, for people that we meet on the left when we have these conversations about pay disputes or what have you. Because the question here is, um, once we engage in struggle and once we recognize that we have the power to win through collective action that we take as, as the working class, so for example, you know, the, the people from a workplace organizing for, for better pay, then we see the power that we hold as a class. Um, if we can win against one boss, we can, what, can we go for the next one? So um, really that presents you with the opportunity to discuss the ideas of LGBT liberation, of um, liberation for any, any minority in our society and to argue for them. And I want to encourage people to, to take that from today's session. And that is the fact that ideas change and struggle. And the, the, it presents a unique opportunity to be to be arguing for, for our position. And we can absolutely win in, in terms of that. I know people mentioned the idea of TERFs and how uh, uh, people in the feminist movement um, might feel a bit skeptical about these ideas. But the thing is, if we don't engage, if we don't engage with the discussions that happen in the workplace, that happen on the picket lines, we might as well just give up on them. The question here is, um, if the ideas of oppression, the ideas of LGBT phobia come from the ruling class, then surely the way that we do fight these ideas is by fighting the ruling class. And it, I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm saying this is the way to win. And I think once we sort of all realize the collective power that we hold and we have these arguments, um, we can absolutely win not only the arguments, but also just essentially what is the entire world. And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks everyone for the discussion. I hope everyone is going to stick around uh, for some of the debates that are happening uh, later on the day and, and contribute to those discussions as well, because I know they're going to be really interesting. I just want to come to some of the questions that we're talking about the role of the family and about how actually kind of women's oppression is tied interlinked with LGBT plus oppression through the role of the family. I completely agree with that. I mean, an interesting thing, Laura Mars is speaking uh, later on today, but an interesting thing in her article I read is that some of the uh, radical feminist TERFs uh, who are attacking trans people are going after what's called the guilt principle, which gives people the right uh, under, under 18 to decide what they want to do with their own health care. Uh, and that's stopped people from young people from accessing gender affirming care and so on and so forth. That principle is also the principle that gives people under the age of 18 the right to abortion, right? And so you actually see these two things being tied quite literally together, right? And I think it's interesting, some of those same people who are telling us now that trans women are a, a, are a threat to cis women were also arguing a few years ago that women wearing uh, the hijab in uh, France and so on is, is, is targeted to the rest of the women. I think we have to say that we choose for the right of every single woman uh, to do what they want with their own body and to wear what they want with their, what, what they want with their own body.
And I'm just coming back to some of the discussion around the protection of children, because we see these tropes kind of coming back time and time again. I think what's quite interesting about the Don't Say Gay Bill in America is it's almost word for word what Section 28 was like. And so actually you see the same kind of things about trans people being a threat to uh, children nowadays. They were saying about gay people about 30 years ago, and they've only dropped that one because they've realised it's, it's not like a go at people are really um, uh, up for that. And so you see these kind of lies coming back time and time again. But I want to kind of come back to this question over here because I actually think it's really interesting to think the speaker at the front kind of went through it. You know, we don't have an exact blueprint. All we can look for is what have happened in, you know, in um, places like Egypt where women were at the forefront of those struggles fighting, fighting for revolutions and stuff like that. But I also want to take a look at what's happening in France at the moment. You know, I think it was, was it last year or the year before? I can't remember. Uh, Marine Le Pen got through to the second stage of the French elections got quite a high, pro, pro, uh, high version, uh, proportion of the vote. Now there is a revolt that's happening in France right now where they are now blocking Marine Le Pen from going to speak at events and calling her what she is as fascist. And so you can see how actually through struggle pe people's ideas change and that's what we want to kind of support. And Lara talked about going down and supporting strikes and I think that's absolutely important. But I think we also want to see how we can make permanent change and it is supporting those drugs, but it's also about joining the revolutionary party who's going to fight every single day to go on all the picket lines, to go on all the trans prides, to fight against the radical feminists and so on and so forth, and fundamentally fight against the system that kind of oppresses us and exploits us. And so that's why I'd really encourage people, if you want to be part of that fight, if you want to be fighting on the day-to-day -day with us, come join the Socialist Workers Party. There'll be little red forms floating around. You sign up, it's the best decision I ever made and we're going to be fighting this fight together.